20-11. After I briefly review the contents of the ordinance, I will uh, move to the public hearing and would appreciate uh, comments from the public this morning. In the spirit of running an efficient and orderly meeting, I will limit public comment to three minutes. Whereas according to the Center for Disease Control, COVID-19 is thought to spread mainly through close contact from person to person and respiratory droplets from someone who is infected. People who are infected often have symptoms of illness. Some people without symptoms may be able to spread the virus. And whereas the Center for Disease Control was, has warned, the virus that causes COVID-19 is spreading very easily and sustainably between people. Whereas Governor Bullock's May 19th, 2020 directive also lifted the 14-day quarantine requirement from travelers from other states and countries effective June 1st, 2020. And whereas it is estimated that in 2018 alone, the city welcomed between 500,000 and 1.25 million visitors. Whereas since Governor Bullock lifted the 14-day quarantine requirement for visitors from other states and countries, the city has experienced a significant influx of visitors, many of whom have traveled from areas with a high rate of COVID-19 infection. And whereas the city recognizes that its citizens and businesses, business owners desire, and that it is in the best economic interest of the community for its businesses to remain open. And whereas since phase two of the reopening, the state has experienced a marked increase in COVID-19 cases with 125, the highest number ever, being reported on July 9th, 2020. Whereas since phase two of the reopening, Flathead County has experienced a marked increase in COVID-19 cases with 38 new cases reported after four weeks of no new cases. And whereas on, on or about June 5th, 2020, the World Health Organization advised governments to encourage the public to wear masks or cloth face coverings to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And whereas the overwhelming consensus of current medical and scientific evidence indicates that wearing masks or cloth face coverings reduces the transmi transmittability of COVID-19 by reducing transmission of infected droplets in both laboratory and clinical contexts. And whereas on July 6, 2020, the city passed resolution 20-18 which strongly encouraged residents, businesses, and visitors to use masks or cloth face coverings to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Whereas Resolution 20-18 provided the city would pass an ordinance requiring the use of masks or cloth face coverings if residents, businesses, and visitors were not adhering to its recommendations. Whereas the city remains committed to following the direction of our health and scientific leaders to protect our community, our most vulnerable populations, and those that work, live, and visit Whitefish. And whereas as a municipal corporation with its own governmental charter, the city is a governing unit that may exercise any power not prohibited by the Montana Constitution, state law, or its own charter. And whereas the city's power and authority are liberally construed with every reasonable doubt as to the existence of a power or authority resolved in favor of the power or authority's existence. And whereas the city possesses an inherent power to enact reasonable legislation for the health, safety, welfare, or morale of the public. Whereas COVID-19 constitutes an emergency situation affecting the public health, safety, and general welfare, and requiring the use of masks or face coverings in public settings in accordance with federal and state guidance will help ensure the health and safety of the city's residents and visitors alike, will reduce the likelihood that the state will reinstate directives closing businesses and will limit the cascading impact on critical services. When will the use of face coverings be required? All places of business must require employees, contractors, volunteers, customers, and visitors to wear a face covering in areas open to the general public. All places of business must require employees to wear face coverings in areas not open to the general public if social distancing of at least six feet cannot be maintained. All individuals must wear a face covering when inside a place of business and when standing in line to enter any place of business. 
All individuals must wear a face covering when riding, or pub when riding on public transportation or when they are a driver or passenger in a taxi, private car service, shuttle, or transportation network company. All individuals participating in organized outdoor gatherings of 20 or more must wear a face covering. All individuals outdoors where social distancing is not possible must wear a face covering. I'd like to review the exemptions that are included in this ordinance this morning. Face coverings are not required, A, for children under the age of 12, provided the adults accompanying children ages 2 through 11 must use reasonable efforts to cause those children to wear face coverings while inside a place of business. B, for any individual who cannot wear a face covering because of a medical condition, mental health condition, or developmental disability, or any individual who should not wear a face covering under the guidance of the Center for Disease Control, an individual is not required to provide medical documentation demonstrating that the individual cannot tolerate wearing a face covering. C, for individuals who are seated at a table or the bar of a restaurant or a bar while such individuals are eating and or drinking. D, for individuals actively exercising or swimming. E, for individuals working in a profession in which the use of a mask or face covering will not be compatible with the duties of the profession or present a safety risk. F, for individuals while in their private individual offices provided social distancing of at least six feet can be maintained. G, for individuals fully separated from the public by a protective barrier, a plexiglass shield that provides only partial protection between the public and an employee does not negate the requirement to wear a face covering. And finally, H, in settings where it is not practical or feasible to wear a face covering, including complying with the direction of law enforcement officers or obtaining services involving the head, face, or scalp, such as dental work, haircuts, and facials. That's the extent of what I will re review. The ordinance is available publicly online for both the public, visitors, residents alike, uh, if you'd like to read it in more detail. With that said, we will move to a public hearing on ordinance number 20-11. Again, if you could limit your comments to three minutes, we would certainly appreciate it. And your name and address for the record, please, when you approach the podium. Name is Ian Trottier, <coughs> uh, council and citizens. I live to the Zika virus in Miami. <coughs> We're facing a very similar uh, 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 pandemic, if you will, but now on a global scale, you notice I'm not wearing a mask. There were pesticides that were shot over from a plane to the citizens there, and just like these folks, some of them, well, the, many of the folks in that council were opposed to the toxic pesticides. We're living in a, why? Because it was banned by the European Union, known as a neurotoxin by studies out of Sweden. Also, Ricky Rosseo, the governor of Puerto Rico at the time, banned the, the substance from entering via the World Health Organization into Puerto Rico. What we're living in right now is an incredibly corrupt society. If you don't see that, I urge you to look at a central banking system. Dave sitting over there had a national syndicated uh, talk radio show. We are living in a, a monopolized form of our currency. Catherine Austin Fitz, who is a former White House economist, graduate of Wharton, and also a graduate of Yale in Mandarin, speaks extensively about what is happening on a global scale because of this pandemic. I'm not here to say that COVID-19 is not a threat. The Zika virus was discovered in the Uganda forest in the 1940s, funded by the Rockefeller, funded by the Rockefeller scientist team. But the Rockefellers also funded the uh, pesticide that was sprayed over the population, that poison, that poisoned the population and caused microcephaly in, in, in folks. This right here is essentially what the Bill Gates Foundation and the Microsoft Corporation is wanting to install into every arm, either in form of a, either in the form of a microchip, he's, he said this, either in form of a microchip or an or a ta uh, ID tattoo. How, and, and if you put this into your skin, then what you're able to do then is make your transactions uh, uh, digitally. This is what's happening is that our paper and coin currencies 
are moving to a digital format. And you need to ask yourself, where is the intrinsic value in a digital currency? There is none. The United States, in my opinion, is in an incredible debt situation. There's a $26 trillion debt. Is there gold? Does Fort Knox have any gold? Has it been hijacked from all of us? If you look at the economic uh, 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 ramifications of this and you get past the health threat, the flu vaccine, the cold vaccines, the cancers, get past that, ask yourself, are your rights being violated by a mandatory mask, then a mandatory vaccine, and then a mandatory microchip, and then we are all in debt slaves. Again, look up Catherine Austin Fitz. You can find more information on my website, Ian Trottier, T-R-O-T-T-I-E-R. You can find it, that I have an extensive history of how the United States has been, uh, has been attacked economically for over 100 years, starting with the Federal Reserve System and, and before that. As I go, there has been one president, Trump is 45, there has been one president that we've had in our history that has left office without the nation in debt. Can anyone name that president? Incorrect. Andrew Jackson. He is the only president, the only president, to leave office without this country in debt. There are meetings that are happening in Jackson Hole on an annual basis, the World, Health, uh, World Economic Forum. This is what is happening to all of us. So we either stand up and take a stance or we remain silent. And putting a mask over my, over my face, in my, in my view, and I noticed as you, gave your, as, you, as you ran over the regulations, you took that mask off. That's exactly what was happening. We are being blindfolded by having our mouths covered. Uh, and I think that's, that's all I was going to say. So iantaracchia.com, please Google Catherine Austin Fitz, and she talks about this debt entrapment. She's a former uh, White House uh, economic, uh, econo uh, econo uh, economic advisor and also a uh, graduate of Wharton and Yale. Thank you. Point of order this morning, we're not going to tolerate clapping, cheering, booing, um, any outbursts from the audience. If it continues, I'll simply recess the meeting. Hi, I'm Bonnie Clausen. I live at 1105 O'Brien Avenue. Uh, the Bible says to show everybody proper respect. So um, I was out in the garden, and I didn't know we were, I thought we had two months to prepare for the next meeting. And so I was just talking to God, and I said, there's no time. And so all I want to say, I don't want to take up a lot of time, is in proper respect, we say the pledge to the flag under one God. And, and some of you don't believe that, and that's the respect I want to show you. You don't have to listen to this. But there are people that I've talked to on the streets, and I talk to people every day who do believe that. So I just want to invite God into this meeting so if you don't believe it, that's okay. But I'm going to invite him for the people who do believe. So Lord Jesus, uh, the God of the Bible, I just invite you to come to this meeting. And I pray that we be at peace. We know that you're the God of the universe and you do have your plans. And we just pray for every person in here that you bless them with the absolute truth, that you pour out your love and your understanding um, there are so many, you can turn on the radio, one doctor says, go out and get the flu now, it's better than later. One doctor says, no. So we in our, are in a state of confusion, but we pray that you bring light to all of this, for all of us in this community. I pray a blessing on everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Hi, I'm Carol Ann Wright. I live at 810 Patton Lane, and I strongly oppose a mass mandate, as do over 600 individuals who signed a petition against such a measure in Whitefish. I urge the council members to take into consideration research that clearly demonstrates mask wearing can cause serious health complications due to reduced oxygen intake. This is particularly concerning in regards to children whose brains are still developing. The supporting studies are found in my letter sent to the council Saturday, July 11th. Research has also shown children worldwide are not a vulnerable segment to the population, of the population to COVID, and not a single case has been documented that demonstrates child to adult transmission. 
children should not be included in the mandate. Beside the fact that they are not vulnerable to this particular virus, children will be constantly fiddling with the mask, adjusting it, touching their face, then proceeding to touch surfaces. This will spread germs far more than going without a mask. If you do choose to move forward with the mandate, I would like to bring to your attention the wording in section three under exemptions, face coverings not required on page seven. Section A states, for children under the age of 12, provided that adults accompanying children ages two through 11 must be, use reasonable efforts to cause those children to wear face coverings while inside a place of business. This language is unclear. The clause is under exemptions, face coverings not required, but then says children need to wear masks within a business. In this age of extreme anxiety and worry, I would like to leave you with Psalm 34, four. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from my fears. I thank the council for your time and consideration. Thanks, Carolyn. Who's next? My name is Dave Von Kleist, 436 West 3rd Street. I'm not going to get into uh, my background and credentials. You already know where I come from and what I've been doing. Thanks, Dave. Last week, when I was here, I drew attention to uh, Senate reports, congressional, congressional hearings, documentation, 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 appropriations bill, Project MK Ultra CIA program of behavior modification. Human drug testing by the CIA in 1977. Biological testing involving human subjects by the Department of Defense, 1977. These people have not had a come to Jesus moment. This stuff has been going on for decade after decade. I just handed out an article from the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'd like to you to turn the page and look at the, this is the beginning of paragraph two. I quote, we know that wearing a mask outside healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from infection. It goes on, in many cases, the desire for widespread masking is a reflexive reaction to anxiety over the pandemic. In other words, this is hysteria. And you go to the next, uh, next highlighted thing, focusing on universal masking alone may paradoxically lead to more transmission of COVID-19 if it diverts attention from implementing more fundamental infection control measures. In other words, they don't do squat, really. I also have, uh, I want to draw attention to the idea, I mentioned it last week, that um, if this is about the public safety and about public health, I applaud your efforts. I offer an open hand and not a clenched fist. However, if this has either a political or a financial motivation, then this is an egregious and abhorrent betrayal of public trust. I know you'll, you'll say that, and I know that there are some folks out there that see me and Ian as conspiracy theorists or tinfoil hat people. If that's what you believe, I want you to raise your hand and slap yourself with it. I want to share with you, if this, if this is not a political thing, then how is it that when I turned on the television this morning and I watched Good Morning America and I went back and forth between the Today Show, and they're all going, please, wear your masks, wear your mask, 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 mask. They had Bill Nye, the science guy, who has the same number of medical credentials as Bill Gates, which is zero, out there spraying around um, uh, talcum powder and trying to convince everybody that we all have to do this, we're all in this together, we have to wear these masks. Well, why is it that they never have somebody expressing the other side of the debate? They don't. And we've had numerous, countless doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, EMTs, posting on Facebook and on YouTube the other side of the story, and Glorioski, their posts get taken down. False information violating community standards. Oh, by the way, I posted a link to Cornell Law to this document. And, and you know what? It's, Facebook said it violates community standards. This is a political issue. It is not about health. 
You're not getting the other side of this story. And I will share with you, it's not my opinion, I will share with you uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly Victory. I want you to listen to her words. And th this is, uh, again, this is probably going to be taken down. Masks are intended for the ill when they will be potentially in contact with others and for those who are caring for them. Multiple medical authorities, including the World Health Organization, the CDC, the New England Journal of Medicine, have now all acknowledged that there is no scientific justification for normal, healthy people to be wearing masks. In fact, prolonged mask wearing actually increases the risk of disease to the wearer. People tend to touch their faces much more often when they're wearing a mask. In addition, we end up rebreathing particles that our lungs have exhaled, whether it's pollen, dust, virus, or bacteria particles. They are trapped in the mask, and on the very next inhale, we breathe them back in. Lastly, many people are wearing masks other than surgical or medical masks, and many of them are not porous enough to allow carbon dioxide that we exhale to fully dissipate. So on every inhalation, we breathe back in more carbon dioxide. Furthermore, and very importantly, habitual wearing of masks decreases the body's natural immune response. We're supposed to come into contact regularly with foreign things, bacteria, viruses, all kinds of things. And that's what helps to keep our immune systems on alert, working at full capacity. If you limit your exposure to everything by constantly wearing masks or the overuse of hand sanitizers and disinfectants, your immune system in effect says, apparently I'm not needed. I'll go on vacation, take a nap. And it won't be prepped and ready when you need it to mount the appropriate immune response. So what's the real risk of contracting COVID-19? Despite what you were led to believe, COVID-19 has not proven to be as contagious. The recent New England Journal of Medicine study showed that it really takes quite a significant face-to-face -face exposure to someone who is sick from the virus for a matter of minutes. And even then, transmission is far from certain. There's a very low risk of contracting the virus from exposure to hard surfaces. The CDC now admits that continuously disinfecting surfaces is unnecessary because the virus simply doesn't live for more than a very brief period of time on surfaces. And lastly, there is a very low risk from exposure to children. It turns out that children who actually have the virus in their noses or mouths harbor a very small amount of it. They have, on average, less than 25%, less than a quarter of the viral load that we find in adults. This may be part of the reason that children simply don't become sick with the virus, but it also means that we don't need to be concerned about being in close contact with them. Okay, I could go on. I won't take much more time, but I just want to point out, I mentioned to you a little while ago that it's, appear, it's becoming painfully obvious to those of us who have been doing any research and paying attention that yes, indeed, this is a global political issue. Why, you might say, and again, here comes the tinfoil hat and the conspiracy theory thing. In the past year, revelations have been, <laughs> I don't want to use that word, I shouldn't use that word. People have been finding out more and more about some of the nasty stuff that's been going on with people like Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, and now Ghislaine Maxwell. This is a global issue, and they need a global distraction to keep people away from digging deeper into this disgusting thing that's been going on behind the scenes. This is a political issue. I, for one, will not comply to the coercion. I read the, the Whitefish pilot yesterday, and you're threatening people with a $300 and a $500 fine. I would ask, what gives you the authority to pass such an, uh, a law? I don't think you have it. If you do, I'd like to know. But I, will, I, for one, will not wear a mask. I find it, it creates anxiety, and I don't want to be breathing back in the things that my body is trying to get rid of when I exhale. So if, you, if, if you're going to make your decision, and I think you've already made your decision, but if you're going to have an open and honest debate about these issues, then listen to the people who are here. How many people are wearing masks? How many people are Dave, wearing masks? Dave, with all due respect, you're, you're pushing about seven minutes. I'm sorry. I, I didn't, appreciate I, your comments. I, 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 this is documentation, it's real. Thank you for your time.
Good morning, my name is Jill Goodrich. I live at 6203 Montera Avenue in Whitefish. Um, I am, and I'll give you a little bit on my background. Um, I work in wildland fire um, and in general in emergency management, so in all hazards, I travel with incident command teams. Um, we work with pandemics. We're trained with pandemics, counterterrorism, uh, fire, wildfire, structure fire, um, earthquakes, hurricanes. If this was about public health, if this was about our health in a community in beautiful, open Montana where we can, we should be outside without masks, breathing in the air, getting the UV rays on us, that's what kills virus. You wouldn't be quoting CDC and World Health Organization stats at us. If it were about health, you would not be doing that. You would have been reading all of these months the way I have, the way a lot of other people have, reading scientific documentation. If you want to quote anybody, you should be quoting stuff out of Johns Hopkins, Stanford, USC. You know what kind of studies they're doing now? They are proving with each and every study that everything that we were told in the beginning about this virus has turned out to be false. Now that's fine. You predict, well, children are gonna spread it. It turns out children are not spreaders. Now it's looking like it's more of a fecal contamination and fecal spread. So you have governors that, the bulk of our numbers in this country are from ignorant governors sending people off to die in nursing homes. I've worked with hospice. That offends me on a personal level that people would be so ignorant that we would elect them and they would, they would do that. And then you have the media and you have the CDC and you have the World Health Organization. They're all recycling their own garbage. You actually care about us? Come up with something that is scientific based. Thank you. My name's Robert Schaefer. I'm not rich enough to have a, an address in Whitefish, but my wife works here, and I do business in Whitefish. Um, I'd like to get away with, or away from uh, talking about uh, whether or not it's right to require somebody to wear a mask and speak more about the enforcement of this. You are not enforcing people to wear masks. You're enforcing business owners to force their customers to wear masks and it is completely uh, unenforceable. The ADA says you're not allowed to ask if somebody has a condition. So without knowing if anybody has a condition, just because somebody says they have a condition, they don't have to wear a mask, all right? So how is it possible to enforce anything of the sort? Are you going to have people going around, going to the bars, looking to see who has a mask on if they're not taking a drink at the moment? Uh, and even if they did, they cannot ask somebody who doesn't have a mask whether or not they have a condition. So I feel like this is an attempt to selectively enforce a law or an ordinance that is not enforceable on certain business owners and not others and I feel it is very wrong. Um, yeah. I'll let you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. <clears throat> Hello, good morning. My name is Desiree Van Ecklenburg, and I'm at 2010 Lion Mountain Loop in Whitefish. Um, I want to share a perspective about mask wearing that I'm not sure a lot of adults consider, which is the younger generation children, whether we're parents or grandchildren or grandparents. My mother and my family are all from Southern California and they're having to live with this very different scenario than here in Montana. And my mom told me a story that really broke my heart this week. And she said, Desiree, I was at Costco and I was in line and of course, California all has masks. And she said, this little boy 
five or six years old, was fiddling with his mask. He dropped his mask on the floor. And his dad said, you know, pick up your mask, put it back on. And the little boy went into hysteria, crying. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to get the disease, and I'm going to die. I'm just unconsolable. And I don't think that through this, should we wear a mask or should we not wear a mask? How contagious is the disease or is it not contagious? We're not really realizing the impact we're having on children and the younger generations. They are succumbing to severe fear that's going to cause psychological implications. And I ask that we really take time and consider the numbers. We know it's a real disease. We know that people are getting it. Um, we know that the mortality rate is not what they initially thought. Um, we also know, or I hope that we all know, that through mutation, diseases are found to get less. They're, le they're known to weaken through mu mutation, not strengthen through mutation. So I just, and, and another common sense, if we look at how infectious disease is really treated in laboratories, we've all seen the hazmat suits. We've seen the gear that they wear. Another young person who unfortunately couldn't be here today said to me, and excuse me, but this is coming from the younger generations. This isn't how I would normally talk, but I'm in the voice for this person right now. Why should we wear a mask if we can let gas out and it still trans... We can smell gas when somebody releases it. The same thing's happening with cloth masks. It's, it's a psychological thing. It's not preventing the spread of any disease. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Desiree. Good morning, my name is Nicolette Covey. I live at 135 Brimstone Drive. First of all, I'd like to thank the council for attempting to protect the health of the citizens of Whitefish and the tourists. Um, I'd like to point out that PPP is only effective if used properly. The majority of people are not trained in proper use of PPE. I feel that asking the general public to wear a cloth or paper mask is largely ineffective. Many studies have been done that show that asymptomatic people are really not transmitting this disease. And so asking asymptomatic people to wear masks, if they are, symptom you know, if they are asymptomatic and we're fiddling with them, you know, you see people in the grocery store, they're pulling this thing down, they're touching their phone, they're putting it back up. I saw a guy with gloves go like this, pulled his mask down, stuck his hand in his mouth, bit the the glove, and then played with his phone. I feel like we need to be very cautious about encouraging improper use of PPE as it could actually further spread this disease. I also want to point out that Montana's death rate is currently 1.7%. It's not as high as the rest of the nation. And I would strongly urge the council to consider the effects that this will have on businesses. If we mandate businesses to enforce mask wearing, we're going to see a reduction in the business's sales volume. If you have to wear a mask, you might choose to go to Columbia Falls to go grocery shopping. So that's going to affect Safeway. If I want to go to Sportsman's, I'm not going to wear a mask in Whitefish. I'm going to go to Kalispell. I'm not going to buy ice cream at Sweet Peaks. I have two boys that are 8 and 10. The thought of wearing a mask gives both of them extreme anxiety. Our 10-year-old actually suffers from anxiety and depression already, so further asking him to wear that is it's detrimental to his mental health. And somebody else pointed out, you know, the effects that this is going to have on children. I think I, I just urge you to strongly consider these factors before making your decision today. Thank you. Thanks, Nikolai. Good morning. My name is Ted Valentiner, 305 Buckhorn Road. Uh, just about a week ago, almost exactly a week ago, I stood up here and I asked, why are we addressing a situation that affects 1% of the population? 
If you look at the, at the statistics that were published today, we're talking about 1% positive. That 1% positive has been addressed by the FDA saying there's a likelihood as much as 50% of the tests are false positives. The, uh, the infection rate by the CDC, and it's verified by an independent study, is approximately 1%. The infectious Fatality rate is 0.26, less than 1%. Here we are one week later, poised to sign an ordinance that will damage business and divide the citizens in this community. Three minutes to speak, but no time for questions. Not exactly participatory democracy. <clears throat> what are the medical qualifications that we're making these decisions on? What medical input are we getting? The, this proposal said that it will be reevaluated in one month. Against what? What criteria? You're going to look at it in one month. First, we had two months to be evaluated. Now, we, then a week later, we're ready to sign it. Based on what criteria? What comes next? Mandatory vaccines? I have a sign significant concern that citizens of Whitefish are not being heard and the members of this council are using what they need to support their agenda. Our, our 600, I think there's probably 600 signatures on our online petition that weren't even considered. The, the efficacy of cloth masks can be discounted by multiple sources. Occupational Safety and Health Administration is one example. They tell you that they don't work. If they worked, why would we, why would we give, not give masks to convicted felons instead of turning them loose by the thousands? My body, my choice, is that only applicable in certain situations? If your mask works, why do you care if I have one or not? As a child, I re vividly recall watching Walt Disney documentary on lemmings. Somehow that keeps coming back to mind. I have no doubt whatsoever our speaking today is merely a facade. We're going through the motions, the decisions have already been made. I will commit today that the passage of this ordinance, I will not spend one more dollar in Whitefish. Regardless of where I have to go, this is not acceptable. Thank you. Hello, my name is Catherine Owens. I live at 329 Shady River Lane. The paper that Dave just handed to you was riddled with COVID. And Ryan was just moving his mask to drink a Coke and placing his mask back on, which means COVID just got in behind his mask. So the Great Northern, who from what I understand has a case, could it be that the bartender handed a drink, the person touched the bartender, handed money, it was on the money, but from what I understand, that's refuted by some statistics, but I want to just point this out. Could that person at the Great Northern have gotten it just through touch? And had that person at the bar been wearing a mask and the bartender, it wouldn't have made any difference. So I watched every one of you grab something that Dave handed out. Money is exchanged in all of these businesses. That is the dirtiest currency in the world. It comes to you sweaty and gross. I used to work in a hardware store. The masks, you're creating division. I've, I said this last week. That's really not good for our community. Um, I have another question. If I'm an employer and every single one of my employees said they had a medical condition, so therefore none of them were wearing masks, would you revoke their license? Because they are not wearing masks, but they have a medical condition. How will you monitor this? Um, is your, I, somebody else, is your mind made up? I read the ordinance. It has a space for John's signature. 
there is a space for the date. I'm surprised your date wasn't already written in. But, um, and lastly, a f my friend uh, asked me about this. Should you find people 300, I can't remember what the money is, the amount is, where is that money going? Is it gonna go to all the children who are suffering under this pandemic? All the children who are staying home with abusive parents who are under undue stress at the moment, so now are now taking it out on their children? Where is this money going? Well, anyway, I just ask you to reconsider, look at, look at the effects. Is the mask wearing, is the cure greater than the curse? And I think it is. And I really ask you, what I noticed last week was that we made our comments and within 10 minutes, 10 minutes you voted. So there was no discussing among the people, wow, did you hear what Catherine said? Did you hear what Nicolette's, Nicolette said? Did you hear what Nicole said? There was none of that. It was almost like this is just a dog and pony show and we're just here so that you can say to the public, um, oh, oh, we listened, but how can you make a decision within 10 minutes after listening? I, that, that, that baffles me. So anyway, it's, it's quite frightening and um, I just hope that you're hearing these people and, and listening to their concern about their families, their children, and this lovely, awesome, beautiful community we live in. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Good morning, Council, and everyone attending. My name is Veronica Hutchison, and I'm at 257 Fairway Drive in Whitefish. I am new to Montana, but I love everything Montana stands for. And I start with that because I came to the state because of its personal choice. And while I am against the mandate, I respect people that are wearing a mask. And I want to pause right there and say thank you for serving your community, not in just this issue. I'm respectful. And I know it is hard to hold office in any position and make decisions, even if you've already made your decision and how you're voting. I want to thank you for your service because I believe in respect. I think trust is earned, but I think respect is given. And my back room comes from hospitality, and that's why I'm here, um, as a portion of what I want to cover. I was a bartender for nine and a half years in my 20s. I'm much older than that, but I won't let you know who I am now. Um, I'm worried about the issues that everybody is speaking about with passion. And because there is no clear-cut, scientific, adaptation that we can all like solidly have a stance on because the, the science is divided, opinions are divided, politics are divided. And guess what else is going to be divided? Personal respect. When there is drinking involved in any of these bars and people start with their passionate conversations, it will get ugly. It will get violent. This is an open carry state as well. And while you can put the mandate on businesses, you cannot put the mandate on the hearts and the, the passionate people that are going to be violent. I really think that this can get to an escalated part in Whitefish that can get very ugly that I don't think anybody wants to talk about. And I'm concerned for our law enforcement. And I would hate to put them in a situation where they had to pull a trigger on somebody. No. You think it's obvious, but I'm serious. I've already been in, in areas where the heated conversation is getting so out of control and you're not going to be able to enforce how to train the people in these situations, even at supermarkets. If someone walks in and they pull it down and the lady goes, hey, you're not wearing your mask, and the other person is completely not a civil person. I am. I, I can come here rationally and speak rationally. I think everybody here is a rational person. Have you guys been out and seen irrational people wandering around? I have. With their voices, with their actions, with their yelling. Are we willing to put our law enforcement at 911 calls for not wearing a mask? What a waste of time. Why are we going to put them in a situation where there's other things that they need to be, make the call on? The thin blue line really is respected by me and all of my family members and every, I, I just, I can't fathom 
the thought of mandating in the state of Montana and all the different personalities that live in Whitefish and think that everyone's just going to comply or even wear it correctly. And then you're going to have fights about wearing it correctly. Have has anyone been to Walmart in Kalispell? They all wear the masks and they clip the bottom and it's all like this. I'm wearing it. When you get mandates, because strongly encourage, I applaud you. Because if that's what you want to do, and based on scientific fact, that's fine. But when you start mandating people, you're going to start mandating their minds to conform to a certain way that they will rebel against. Yes. And I just think that our law enforcement doesn't deserve those 911 calls. And I think that in grocery stores and restaurants and hotels, you're going to see people act out. And it's unnecessary when you can just continually strongly encourage and non -man not mandate that situation. And I also think everyone watching, like children, seeing other adults fight over this issue, unhealthy mentally. The mental health of society is just as important as the physical health as well. And if you give incentive to people, if you really want them to wear masks, give them incentive, give them encouragement, give the positive. Whenever you put mandate on anything, it is not going to help anything but strike up chaos with the differences of minds. And if you're prepared to go to that battle of war of mind, then by all means pass it today. But if you want to be rational, if you really want to move forward with something that you think can help the public, then do it as a strongly encouraged. Don't put people in a position to exercise violence that they think that they're entitled to, even though that's absolutely wrong. Yes, people believe this way. I'm up here trying to educate you. She keeps looking at me like, really? Really, this is the real world. Maybe not in Whitefish, Montana, if you, this is the only place you've been exposed to. But I've been exposed to every, everywhere. I'm a world traveler. Point of order, you're well Yes, your thank you. I, 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 will, I will stop, but it, it will happen here. Just like COVID did. Violence will happen, and it's not me. I'm not up here to make a threat. I'm up here to enlighten and encourage you guys to make a normal mis decision that would be healthy for this community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Chason, and I live at 704 Cedar Street here in town. Um, I also work as a science teacher here with the children in our town. Um, and I just wanted to speak um, for myself and also for many of the others who chose not to come today um, based on the fact that we're in an indoor space. And um, all right, I'll start from my notes. Um, so I wanted to just back up for a second and encourage the council to prioritize public health over short-sighted decisions that bring money to businesses. I think prioritizing human lives, it should be our first priority. Um, if we're looking to site-specific studies, um, sort of going against those economic arguments, we could look to Sweden, where they did not have um, any precautions or any mask wearing, and that did not help their economy, and it also, um, public health suffered dramatically. Um, I also wanna point out that here in the Flathead, one thing that made me, a lot of people have spoken to anxiety today. Um, one of the things that made me feel most anxious was on June 15th, which was literally 14 days after we started the, our initial reopening here in the state. That was the first day that we had new cases. We had gone 56 days with no new cases in the Flathead Valley when we had the stay at home order in place and we had precautions in place and literally 14 days after we started to see new cases again. Um, I do recognize that our numbers remain low in Montana, um, not surprisingly, we have a much smaller population, we have um, much less density of people in our living spaces and in our businesses and no public transportation. For a variety of reasons, um, our numbers remain much smaller, but that's not a reason to not take precautions. Um, I also wanna throw out there with the, our numbers being low, um, personally I think our numbers are a lot lower than they actually are. A lot of the folks who come here to vacation and to visit, they're visiting for less than 14 days. 
Um, and they're here, they're part of our community transmission, they're out and about, they're acting as vectors and spreading any germs, whether it's COVID or others. And then they return to their home states, and if they're ever tested positive and counted, they're counted in their home states, not here in Montana. So our numbers are actually um, probably significantly higher than, than what's recorded, and we don't have a way of knowing that um, without better sharing of information between states. Um, I think that mask wearing, and I can speak for, I wrote down the names of 29 of my um, friends and neighbors this morning that are residents here in Whitefish that chose not to come today, um, but that I just could think of as I was drinking my coffee this morning, at least 29 people who all support uh, mask wearing as a very small, easy step. It's easy to implement. It's incredibly small as far as a step and it encourages a greater sense of community health um, decisions among our people. I think also because wearing masks is a more visible thing, I think that um, this step then encourages other measures as well, whether it's social distancing, it's, it's a good reminder in a lot of ways, more frequent hand washing, all of these small sanitation steps that are easy to take and, and certainly should be taken. Um, today we've heard from mostly folks who are opposed, um, certainly. Um, I already mentioned that there's a lot of folks who are in favor of mask wearing, um, but that chose not to come today. A um, couple of um, things that I heard today as a science teacher, I can't help but um, go back on the mutations for a second. Um, there is no, nothing at all to show us that mutations make viruses weaker consistently. Mutations can be positive, negative, or neutral. Um, they can make it stronger, weaker, or the same. Um, shopping, people have talked about not shopping in Whitefish should the order go into place. I can tell you right now, I have, normally I would support local stores, but for the last month, I have not been shopping in Whitefish. I've been shopping at the box stores and online because they are implementing mask wearing um, and they are requiring people to wear masks. So I feel more comfortable shopping in those spaces. If we implement mask wearing, I would return my business to our local businesses. So I think you could um, find people on both sides of, of that fence. Um, talking about the anxiety in children, um, and a lot of people have mentioned um, anxiety for wearing a mask. I can tell you right now with the 150 students that I taught this year, um, we had some discussions during April and May and some, some writing assignments. And um, there are a lot of them who are anxious that we're not being more cautious and anxious that we're not um, taking precautions and they would support those. Um, I just want to end by saying that there are numerous scientific studies that support um, small steps towards hygiene, such as mask wearing, and I thank the council for considering that. Thanks very much, Megan. Kevin. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I think it's still morning. It is still morning. Uh, Kevin Gartland with the Whitefish Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to this ordinance. Uh, obviously a very divisive issue on a number of different levels, um, emotional, psychological, fiscal, um, and I'm not going to help you clear it up at all. I'm not here to tell you that the chamber took a position one way or the other because we didn't. Um, I did get about half of my board together to talk about the issue today, and they were about as evenly divided as you can be, just like the rest of the community. And a um, little different than last week when we went about this this procedure when we went with the, the voluntary uh, encouragement to wear the ordinance or wear the mask and, and we gave a approval to that. All of our, all the folks on my board have already implemented that in their businesses. They are already, their employees are already wearing masks, they're supplying them with masks, they're requiring them to wear masks. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the philosophical or political end of this stuff, but I do want to ask a couple questions on behalf of my board and just some clarification when you get to the discussion end of this thing. Uh, number one, how the ordinance is going to be enforced, both indoors and out. Our business members, when they do uh, express opposition to the ordinance, is because they're uncomfortable being put into the position of enforcing this on behalf of the city. They don't know how that's going to run down. Uh, they don't know uh, how strict it's going to be. Um, they don't know how the mask-up law is going to be communicated more effectively to our visitors. 
so that they understand that they're expected to wear a mask inside and it's not completely upon the individual businesses, some of whom are comfortable with it and some of whom are not comfortable with it. Um, who's going to support the local business owner or their employees when they're, when they're confronted by a patron who refuses to mask up or to leave their place of business? Is that a 9-11 call? Is that a police department call? Because I have several folks in the hospitality industry who say that's exactly what they intend to do. They don't want to put their frontline workers in the position of having to enforce law on behalf of the city, the city council. Um, interesting way, not defunding the police, just kind of shifting a little bit of responsibility there. And finally, if business owners must supply masks to customers who don't have one or don't have them with one with them, what can the city do to help to defray some of that cost to our business owners? Uh, we're working on some, some, some avenues in that regard uh, on the potential that we may have to go down that road, but uh, we would certainly like to see uh, what the city can do to help with that because it's not, it's not a small expense. Just the last few weeks since we've reopened, I have businesses who have spent upwards of $5,000, small mom and pop businesses, just on protective gear to try and make themselves and their customers feel safer. So just a couple of things there. You have a lot of things to think about. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michael Covey. I live at 135 Brimstone Drive. Um, first of all, I think that, you know, Every life matters, and you know, there's been 32 people in Montana that have died so far from this, and that is sad, but where do you draw the line? Um, there's been 90 people so far this year in Montana <clears throat> that have died in auto accidents. There was a period last month where in four days, 12 people died. Um, do we institute a 25 mile an hour speed limit statewide? I think that would curb that pandemic. I mean, you have to, you have to decide where to draw that line. Um, and then a mandate like this, I think you need a lot of facts behind it. And the facts in this ordinance are from the CDC and WHO, which repeatedly every couple of weeks, they change their minds on something, and that means it is not a fact. You know, a fact is two plus two, it always adds up. You can't change it continually and then expect people to believe that when you change it a couple weeks after that. Um, yeah, I just uh, think you really need to think about this. I believe your minds are already made up, but hopefully you're listening to people today. Thanks, Michael. Maggie Eisenbar, 337 Shady River Lane. I think that if the health of um, the community was a priority, that this meeting would have been held outside so that your 29 friends could have attended, that were opposed to attending because we we're in a closed space. I find it ironic that we're talking about prioritizing human lives as the science teacher referenced when on Spokane, human lives are not prioritized. Um, so if Whitefish is interested in saving lives, we should start there, and then we can work towards putting cloth over our faces, which I've noticed every single one of you, like already has been mentioned, have been touching the whole entire time and then touching the tables. I couldn't see you. Excuse me? I haven't touched I couldn't see you where I was seated. <laughs> well, that's two of you. Um, so, um, as, and also there's not six feet here from the person behind you, so that's interesting enough. So it's, it's kind of like it's becoming a symbol, like who's going to wear a mask just for the sake of wearing a mask to prove that we care, which is not why um, anybody should have something mandated. Um, if they're going to be fines, 300 to $500, how do you decide if it's 300 325 350 400 What is the variance there between that number amount? Where is the money going to that is collected? I think um, hand washing is, um, decreases the spread of the virus. We could have hand washing stations all over downtown um, because all of us can say that we have a medical condition and therefore not wear a mask, including all employees and employers. Um, and I think it's undue um, pressure on businesses. They should have to provide, the city should have to provide those masks if that's what's being required of them. And um, in the grain, so everyone else is talking about um, how if you're going to go into a business, who's going to be mandating and making sure 
um, that those people have masks on. My son works at Super One. People are already getting violent. I don't know if they're getting violent, but they're upset and they're being vocal about being upset. Either or, you have a mask on or you don't have a mask on. Um, and there's a lot of children that work there and they're seeing you know, adults act like lunatics. Um, this is whitefish and I think it's also America and we should have the freedom to choose. Um, thank you. Who's next? Hi everyone, my name is Violet Lucas and um, I, ha I, have, okay. I have asthma and if I were to wear a mask, um, I couldn't breathe and my sister has a little bit of trouble with um, breathing too at night and she needs oxygen, like those bottles, and a mask. Sometimes she has it in day, and if she was forced to wear a mask and she didn't have oxygen and she had to wear a mask, the mask is opposite than oxygen because you're just breathing your own, your, in, your own air and it's a little bit unhealthy for you, so... My name is Jenna Anderson. I actually live out of town, but I have worked and played in Whitefish for the last five years. And I've been in the health and wellness industry as a personal trainer for the last 20 years. And the one thing that I think needs pointed out is you can't force health on someone. At some point, people have to take responsibility for their own health and their own decisions. And if they do that by wearing a mask, great. But you can't force your health decisions on somebody else and ever get positive results. It never works. So to come in and say, you have to wear a mask, is forcing a health belief on someone, and that never, never takes. You never get changed like that. Strongly encouraging it, but letting people make their own decision, great, they'll be more likely to make a decision there. But to say, you must do this, that never works in the health industry and saying, hey, I'm gonna be healthy, I'm gonna make a decision, I'm gonna do this. Guilt does not create long-term results. So if we're really looking at long-term results on being healthy, you have to let people make their own decision. And we're not doing that. My name is Nicole Hale, and I live at 422 Ice House Terrace. Um, just a couple of things. I wasn't planning on talking, but um, there was a couple of points that I thought were really well made. I um, am not going to turn this into a political issue. Um, I do like what Ron Paul, a libertarian, had to say about um, the death count. The daily death count has morphed into the daily new case count, as 100,000 tests a day have exploded into 700,000 tests. Is it a wonder that cases are increasing, but what they dare don't mention is that deaths and even the death rate continue to decline. In fact, the CDC warns that COVID is at the stage where it cannot be even classified as an epidemic due to declining deaths. Still, more masks are required, and he says petty dictators all around are calling for a return to lockdown. Can the truth ever be heard above all the lies? And I know that you're not calling for a lockdown, but that's for... Um, other states. The CDC, I didn't know this, but the CDC is not an independent agency. It is a vaccine company. The CDC owns over 20 vaccine patents. It sells about $4.6 billion of vaccines every year. So my question is, is why are we allowing the ones who profit from vaccines, such as the CDC, making the rules? I, for the first um, four months, I was wearing the mask. I suffer from migraines, debilitating migraines. If anyone knows, um, I mean, I get auras. I, I mean, I literally have to pull my car off the road when I get an aura. It's just awful. So I was wearing the mask, and I was, I was, I was believing all of this. I was like, this is a pandemic. Um, you know, we all are in this together. But then I just started to question, you know, it, and and so. When we say it's just a mask, 
I want to say it just, I want to read this first of all. So you say it's just a mask and then it's just six feet. It's just two weeks. It's just non-essential businesses. It's just non-essential workers. It's just a bar. It's just a restaurant. It's just to keep from overwhelming the hospitals. It's just until the cases go down. It's just to flatten the curve. It's just a few inmates. It's just to keep others from being scared. It's just for a few more weeks. It's just church, you can still pray. It's just prayer. It's just until we get a vaccine. It's just a bracelet. It's just an app. It's just for tracing. It's just to let people know you're safe to be around. It's just to let others know you've been in, who you've been in contact with. It's just a few more months. It's just some more inmates. It's just a video. It's just a post. It's just an email account. It's just for protecting others from, uh, others from hate speech. It's just for protecting others from hurt feelings. It's just a large gathering for protest. It's just a few violent protests. It's just a little microchip. It's just a blood test. It's just a scan. It's just for medical information. It's just to store a vaccination certificate. It's just like a credit card. It's just a few places that don't accept cash. It's just so you can travel. It's just so you can get your driver's license. It's just so you can vote. It's just mail-in voting. It's just a few more years. It's just a piece of cloth. It's just a clump of cells. It's just a fetus. It's just a religion. It's just your freedoms gone forever. And with that being said, um, you know, I wave to Kevin Conway. He's my neighbor. I wave to him every day. And it's just heartbreaking because I know that man could issue me a ticket, could send me to eventually to jail for not wearing a mask. And, and if we say this isn't divisive, then I think we're fooling ourselves. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Nicole. Further public comment this morning? Thank you. The name's Charlie Lyman, 230 Forest Ridge Drive. It's not in the city limits, and it's what we used to call the donut. I was away from this area for two and a half months in Mexico from March 15th through June 3rd. And around April, end of March, the, the, the word was out that you had to wear a mask. Otherwise, you're going to go to jail for for 36 hours. And that was a wake up call because everybody said, I don't want to spend 36 hours in Mexican jail. I don't want to spend 36 hours next to a bunch of people where I might catch the virus. Oh, I'll put on a mask. So we all put on masks and did our daily routines. For two and a half months, I, my world was a five block radius. The beach was closed. Um, I took Spanish lessons. It, it, you know, it was, I had a nice time. I came back and I was shocked at how few people were wearing masks. It was a first thing I noticed. And I just don't think it's that hard. I see divisions here in this room. I see them all over the place. I see them all over the valley. The town I was in had 9,000 people. A half a million people were in Cancun, 30 minutes away north. 150,000 people were in Carmen de Playa, about a half hour south. Um, they were surrounded by the virus, and they didn't want to catch it. So like I said, I see division here, but back there I saw a community of 9,000 brothers and sisters and moms and grandmothers and aunts and uncles who rely on tourism like crazy. And I grew up in this town, a few others of us here have. And um, I think it's safe to say that Whitefish has changed. And I think it, it, it's changing too much, but I can't talk about that topic too much. I just want to ask people to wear masks. It's a polite thing to do. I just checked 109 cases uh, just came into Montana or just were reported this morning. Nine of them were in the Flathead Valley. Last week, we were getting several days in a row of zeros. And I think this we had eight yesterday, nine today here in the Flathead. So it's here and it's where I work. I work at a major hotel. I've talked to people from Texas, this is in the past five days, Texas, Florida, California, Washington State, Illinois, Georgia, and Tennessee. Um, those places have problems. And it is unnerving to talk to a family of four from Tampa, 
not wearing a mask. Um, it, it's kind of scary. So the other day, yesterday, I ran into a friend I hadn't seen for a while, and he was wearing a mask. And he said, you're wearing a mask. I said, yes, so are you. And then he kind of jokingly said, are you worried you have it? I said, well, I'm exposed to enough people where I think it's polite to wear one because I see these people day in and day out and I get paid to do it. And when I go home, I stay home. I don't really like to be out in public. So maybe I have been exposed. Maybe you were exposed when you got those papers. So let's just wear a mask. It's really easy to do. I rode a bike 14 miles a day in 100 degree heat with humidity. I was able to breathe. I have asthma. My prescription costs 300 bucks a month. But I wear a mask and I'm okay. And I hope you all start to wear masks someday. Thank you. Thanks very much, Charlie. And I apologize I didn't return your phone call. I try to get back to everyone that calls, but it's been, it's been a bit hectic. My name is Robert Niles, 909 Kellensville Avenue. And uh, I wasn't going to talk, but uh, that was a little bit irritating. I mean, I understand that people are passionate about this, and I'm pretty passionate about it too. You know, we're talking about, for me personally, talking about my freedom, right? I mean, you want me to give up and, and do what you want me to do to make you feel better. No. No, this country doesn't stand for that. This country stands for freedom. And if I don't want to do it, why are you going to force me to do something that I, that I don't want to do just to make yourself feel better? I, I don't get that at all. For any topic. It's not just this topic, it's any topic. And I just implore you that if any time you're going to make a decision that affects people's freedoms in their lives, other than your own, if there is any, any doubt in your mind Error on the side of freedom every time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randy Larson. I live in the county. I have a business here in Whitefish. As a business owner, I'm held to a higher standard by you. I have to have a business license that I pay for. I have to have insurance to make sure that the people that come into my store are protected. I have to make sure my own insurance is paid for by the money that I make. If I want to raise, I don't get to just raise taxes. I have to market my business. I have to market my business with a great amount of my own personal income to get people to come into my store. An impact like this could be a personal opinion, like Costco, demanding that people wear a mask, dividing half of the uh, potential customers from coming in and protesting their, their, their business. I choose not to do that. I choose to make the products that I sell here in Whitefish. People like that because I make the products here in Whitefish. I represent Whitefish very well. A couple months ago, I uh, got together with some of the business owners that are on the same street that I share, and I asked them to draw some more marketing to our, our businesses, because we're not on Central. I said, I'll pay personally for a sign to put out on the street, and it won't advertise me or your businesses. It'll just say, our street is open for business. Put it out there. Two days later, I got a complaint. One of your uh, um, officers here in the city came down and told me to take the sign down because it wasn't ordinated for that. I had to immediately take it down. Yet, a couple days ago, I noticed that there is now a rainbow vomiting grizzly bear mural that is, has nothing to do with the colors of this city. It doesn't promote anything. It's just somebody's personal opinion of what art should be. So I want to talk about last week's uh, little uh, mandate that you guys had or, or, or request that you had to wear masks. I listened to several of you making comments. Rebecca, you made a comment about a Seattle and a New York family that came into town and they were not social distancing. 
your personal anxiety turned into judgment on those people, and you made a judgment that stated that in your personal opinion, that was not acceptable. So we already know your opinion on this situation, but that, doesn't, that is not my opinion. Andy, I heard you say you make big bucks. We pay you big bucks here, you said. And you said that nobody's gonna change, you can pick science from both sides and nobody's gonna change anybody's opinion. Yet you said, let's make a compromise. I say, let's make a compromise too. I say, let's see the city council and the mayor step up and you say, businesses, if you're gonna be required to cut half of your, uh, or to alienate half of your customers, maybe you should give us a forgiveness on some of our taxes. Let us have a little bit of relief during the, this mandate that you're about to vote on. Let us, uh, I lost 98% of my profit in the month that you closed and required 98% of my sales were lost because of the fort quarantine. Nobody came into town. This town is built on the guests that come into, into it. The people love it. I love it. I, I, I used my own money to build the business here, okay? John sent out a little video in favor of these protesters that were outside of City Hall last few weeks or so. A couple days later, I sat there and I watched an Antifa child stand in front. I was parked at the uh, stoplight here next to an officer, William Dials, one of William Dials' officers, and I parked next to him, and this infant Antifa child walked in front of him with an ACAB sign while the light was still red in front of his face. Had a mask on. And what that officer had to endure while this guy shoved that sign in front of his face. Do you know what ACAB AB means, folks? It means all cops are bastards. I collect resort taxes for our officers. I love our officers. But you allowed that person to voice his opinion. You not only did you uh, allow that, but you made a video in this very room supporting the right to mm -hmm. protest. I have no problem with people protesting. But how about, how about giving the right to both sides? How about standing up and saying that was wrong? Not just, the, not just the guy that went off and freaked out. So I'm here today to say, let's be consistent. If you're going to mandate us to collect, um, uh, buy masks for our employees, and you're going to also enforce the ordinances that we have to abide by, and I'm talking to all council members, if you're gonna require that, then how about a little bit of relief on taxes? How about you guys take a tax or a pay cut and send it our way, okay? We make the money that we go. We don't have a union. We don't have unions to pay our little school teachers that, that the science teacher says here, there's 29 people. I'm here because this is a personal attack, in my opinion. And I haven't said, my last statement here, I have not recognized one of your faces. You are the city council that represents this city that I collect taxes for to pay your salaries. And I haven't point, seen- Point of order. And I have not record, seen one of we, you we in my all store. We volunteers, sir. We don't get a dime. I don't see one of you in my store. I haven't seen one of you. If you've been there, great. But if you really want to know the pulse of what's going on in the city and seeing the quality of the people that, run, that, that make this city happen and that actually draw tourism to the city, all this is paid by taxes that we collect. Thank you for your time. Okay, my name is Linda Shannon, 305 Buckhorn Road, and this is just going to be very brief. Um, I've noticed you've put a lot of posters around Whitefish, and there's a line in there that says we are all in this together, and you may not be aware, but that's straight from Hitler's handbook. To He got the Germans to comply with what he had in mind with that very line, and you can research it. 
So this is what you're doing. You're trying to brainwash everybody so that we conform to what you've already made up your mind to do. Um, Lindsay Schott, and I live at 708 Lupfer Avenue. Thank you for having this meeting. I know it's um, not a scheduled meeting, and I just wanted to say that I hope you vote for masks. My child, who doesn't want to appear on camera, came down in a mask to say that he has no trouble breathing. Um, I was going to take my shirt and pants off because those are, I think, required things. I actually also would like you maybe to buy my shirt and my pants because I'm required to wear shirt and pants around town. I just, I had to come down today because I was hearing ridiculous things <laughs> over this microphone. Wear a mask, people. The CDC now recommends it. We only have 22 ICU beds in the Flathead Valley. It's not a big deal. I can't see. It's a pain in the ass. We're trying to like be in this together. Like I cannot believe that this town is like arguing over wearing something that will keep other people safe. I moved here 25 years ago. Everyone was in it together 25 years ago. People did things to help other people out. You're wearing a mask to help out your fellow community members. I feel very nervous and really pissed at what I am watching on television. The arguments that you guys are arguing are ridiculous. They're not based on science. <laughs> Point of order. And Point of order, show some respect to the speaker. The CDC respect. is currently recommending that all people wear masks to cut down on the rate of infection. And the city should follow suit with that. I'm sorry, my glasses are masked up. But what this is also showing people is that CO2 is not building up in my mask because it's fogging my glasses up. So air is going in and out. I have three minutes. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you for your comments. Hey there, Jack Hutchison, uh, Whitefish, Montana. Don't want to give my address in fear of, uh, you know, civil war. Um, anyways, uh, I moved here from California um, 18 months ago. I got out of the swamp, um, and I came to a place that I thought would be a little more at ease when it comes to um, being open-minded in the sense of looking at both sides of the story. Um, like people are saying, already today here, you all have already made up your minds. I lived in California for 40 years. I lived in Japan, I lived in Europe. Socialism, socialism is on its way. And the fact that you guys are sitting here already making up a decision and not letting the people of Montana have this right, and, and I think the majority of the people here, and we might not have all the signatures yet, but maybe we just do a vote, a city vote, rather than letting you vote. Why don't we do that? Because to me, that, that would be the fairest way to do this. And maybe before you vote, I ask all you city council members, come up here for three minutes and tell us why you voted and explain it in detail. I think that's fair. Would you agree? Can, can, would you agree to that? You agree to that? Because I, I think that way, you're showing your transparency. We need transparency, okay? It's kind of like uh, an email went out and it said, there were 500 emails saying, we support mass, and 350. Wow, what a round number. So, so transparency, was there 350, or was there 359 and 507? Or did somebody send it from multiple emails? Give me transparency. I want to see all 500 emails. I want to see where they came from, who they came from, and if there were multiple emails from the same person. Will you, will, will you give us that transparency? You, you'll give it all to us with the names. Then don't say 500 and 350 because that, that's not transparent, is it? Is it? No or yes? I guess, I guess you can't. This isn't a give and take, sir. Provide your public comment and then use your three minutes. Okay, so last is fear. All you're doing is creating fear. <laughs> okay, fear, fear is, is what you want. There's no need for fear here. This is a wonderful, beautiful place. This is why I left California, is to come to a peaceful place where people can get along. And the fact that you're pre making this divide, you want to become a San Francisco. <laughs> Further public comment this morning.
Scott. My name's Scott Worster. I live at 222 Montana Avenue here in Whitefish. I wasn't planning to come to speak today. Um, I was watching this live stream on Facebook um, and was astonished to see a long line of people in a room not wearing masks to come up here in a public place and when I was explaining to my wife that I thought I needed to come downtown and represent the people who are staying home because it's safer. Um, and we had words about, you know, whether I should go down. Is it safe enough to go down there to a public forum and express support and gratitude to the city council for having the courage to step up, do the right thing, set the proper example for the rest of the state. Are masks perfect? Do they work all the time? No. Should we be doing more? Yes. What I, I have this on as a courtesy to the rest of you. And I see the smirks and the, you know, the eye rolling. You've been shouting people down up here who are worried about their loved ones at home like I am. My wife is, was born with a, with a um, congenital birth defect that makes her especially susceptible and places her at greater risk. You know, when I go back home, am I going to have to sterilize? You know, I don't know. I'm in, in a concentrated room with a lot of people who are not... And, and the reason we're here now is because council put the ordinance up and said, let's try it voluntary. Let's all be good neighbors. Let's treat one another with respect and concern. And that didn't work. So if you want to ask why we're here now, the answer is because of every one of you who's not wearing a mask. Thank you very much, Council, for taking our health and safety seriously. I strongly encourage you to pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, before you provide yeah. another round of comments, I want to ask for others who haven't commented to oh, provide sure. them the opportunity, please. Are there further public comments this morning? Further public comments? Chris. Morning. Sorry, out of breath. Just got off my bicycle coming down. Uh, my name is Chris Schuster. I live at 504 Spokane Avenue. I'm an owner of the Garden Wall Inn. Uh, this is our 33rd year in business. Um, also a founding member of the Heart of Whitefish, member of the Resort Tax Committee for many years. Um, I support this ordinance and hope that you pass it. Um, sorry, I'm out of breath. Not because of the mask. Um, just wanted to clarify a couple things. The resort tax doesn't pay salaries, doesn't pay for the police. It's collected and used to repair streets and enhance our parks. And 5% stays with businesses. And 25% goes to property tax relief and always has. Um, I love Charlie Lyman's comment. It's just common courtesy. And uh, I think it's reasonable to, for the council to pass this ordinance. Our guests come from all over the country. Um, normal years, they come from out of the country as well. Um, our guests from Montana, from Florida, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from California, from Texas, they have all been shocked at the number and percentage of people not wearing masks just as a gesture of common courtesy. They've truly appreciated the people who do wear masks and the businesses that are making the effort to wear masks um, for their safety. And 
I understand that this ordinance doesn't require small children to wear masks or people with a health issue to wear masks. Um, it's quite reasonable and uh, I thank you for taking the time to have a special meeting to look at this. I think it's really important for our community. Um, I grew up here, um, have lived here for 48 years, uh, as has my family. My father's 82. He's told me many times how much he appreciates people wearing masks. Um, and because he does it, because it makes him feel like he's part of the community where you've lived for many, many years, and that it's the least we could do. Um, it's not an undue burden on us. And again, thanks very much, and I hope you'll move forward with this ordinance this morning. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, you bet. Further public comment this morning? Further comments from the public? Jill, if you have anything new to add, I'll allow one minute. Otherwise, we've been going yeah. for 90 minutes. Yeah, I do. I want to know who here has already had COVID. I mean, we're, get, we're getting lectured about. Mr. I, Mayor. I have. Point of order. Steve. This is not a question and answer I, session. This is a chance to provide public It's comment. rhetorical. Jeez. It's rhetorical. I have. And let me tell you what. When I do wear my masks and I wear my PPE, I wear proper PPE and I wear it properly. I wear it for hazmat or whatever it is that I need to do. When I'm out and about, I've already had COVID. I've read all the science. All the latest science. If I keep my hands washed, I don't get too close to people, conscientious of people that are older. My goodness, asking me to do something to be polite? I left a high paying career to serve the public. Don't lecture me on polite. I am polite. When people were sucking up toilet paper, I was out making sure that all my neighbors had everything that they need because they weren't properly prepared. How many of you were doing that? If you are sick, stay home. If you're worried, wear a mask. Otherwise, it's none of your business about my health background or why medically I don't have to wear a mask when I'm out. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment, and we're going to go ahead and recess until 11.45. I just, public I just comments had... closed. Well, I'll just ask the recess. people, that's fine, I'll just ask the people here. It seems like...
Folks, we're going to try to get started if you wouldn't mind taking your seats. I do. Going to go ahead and call this meeting uh, back to order. Our public hearing is closed on Ordinance 20 11. Uh, I appreciate the comments we received this morning. For the public record, I also wanted to inform the public that I did actually read all write in comments. We received 356 written comments um, on this ordinance 69% in favor, 27% opposed, 4% um, others um, undecided on the matter. And for the public record, all the comments that we have received on both the resolution and the ordinance will be appended to today's council packet. And that will include all email correspondence from July 6th on. And again, that's available on the city's website at cityofwhitefish.org. Before I turn it, I guess I will turn it over to the council first. And let's first begin by addressing any questions or concerns on the substance of the ordinance, because I imagine there's probably some questions that we do have for staff, and I'm going to start with Ryan. Um, Angie or Dana, could you just kind of give a brief overview of enforcement and how it's going to look and what it's going to look like uh, with potential fines? Um, and I know the civil penalty distinction versus the criminal penalty distinction can be a bit confusing, so if you could just spend a couple minutes going over that, I would appreciate it. Sure. Um, so from, uh, there's two sides to this ordinance. Um, one is um, businesses being required to have their customers come in and uh, wear a mask. For businesses that do not comply, there, are, there is our business license, um, is, the, is the enforcement mechanism that we have for businesses. Um, penalties for that um, include, and I will take this down for those that might be reading lips on camera, um, for those that do, um, that do violate that um, ordinance, we would take an approach of first reaching out to the businesses to make sure they're informed of the ordinance and they understand what is going on. We will not just go straight to writing a citation. We want to know if there are people in your business, is it because they have um, a breathing issue or they, they meet the accommodations that need to be required under ADA? And so I want people to understand that we aren't going to go straight out and start fining businesses um, or pulling a business license. So uh, we would work with um, individuals uh, that own businesses to help them make sure that they are following the ordinance. Um, if they don't, then we would move through the civil citation process and then eventually could pull a business license. Um, I think uh, from an enforcement standpoint, obviously this is going to be a complaint-driven ordinance. And so we have and will create a form similar to what the health department uses for complaints on their requirements, where an individual could complain about a specific business, then we investigate that complaint. Um, for individuals, for individuals who uh, will not wear a mask on private property, so on our business premises, and refuse to leave, then um, the police department would be involved at that point, um, where they would be called, and that would be the only time that we would have people call 911, because it would be disorderly conduct, and that would be under, um, potentially under disorderly conduct or under our civil uh, citation process. I don't know, Angie, is there anything you want to add from a legal standpoint? So to be clear, this um, ordinance is not, does not involve criminal penalties. Nobody is going to jail if they were to be found in violation of this ordinance. What it is is it's a civil infraction. It's a fine. The fine depends on what the court sets the fine as. It can be up to $300 for the first offense and up to $500 for the second offense. That does not mean that is what the fine will be. So just to be clear, nobody's going to go to jail for this at all. Ben. 
Is there any means that this ordinance would apply to gatherings that are not in a business? I examples that I came up with might be this meeting or farmer's market or the post office. Right, so the way that the ordinance is written is that it is for uh, gatherings of 20 or more um, outdoors. So for a farmer's market, that's a special event through the city of Whitefish. We already require that they follow the health department's guidelines and has, have approval from them on their approach to ensuring that they're meeting the guidelines that the governor has set out. Um, now moving forward, this would require that they would um, have mandatory masks for customers and for their vendors. Um, the, I think the, the big change here is that, you know, if you're planning a wedding somewhere, it is that we need people to wear masks if they're gathering 20 or more. The, the number of cases in Montana have been um, due to gathering, and that is um, probably one of, our, one of our more higher risk um, areas. The city meetings would also require masks um, anytime you're indoors, and there's organized gathering of 20 or more, and so I think that's one of a, a very important thing. So um, say you go with a family of uh, your family and you go to City Beach, we have um, precautionary measures in place to ensure social distancing there so that you're with your individual group. Masks would not be required in those situations, even though there are more than 20 people on the beach. But if it's an organized gathering of 20 or more, um, we would have masks because social distancing, what we've seen at Farmer's Market, it has been a very uh, challenge for those organizers. And um, that, that's the, how the ordinance reads. So. Do, do we have the, the legal teeth to enforce it if all the enforcement is through the business licenses? For special event permits, we do. So the city manager has in our ordinance, um, I can approve or deny an event, and part of those criteria is for safety um, of our public, um, safety and health for public. Anything further, Ben? Not at this moment, thank you. Not at this time. Frank, any comments or questions for staff? No, Your, no, Your Honor. Steve? Nothing now, thanks. Rebecca? Um, Dana, in the past I've called on things like disorderly dogs that were getting in fights and people breaking into a neighbor's house and just a number of safety issues. Does a citizen have the right to call on someone that they think is um, causing an unsafe situation to the health of someone else in this ordinance? So, you know, our recommendation with this is that it's going, to, it's going to have to be the business owner or manager or an employee there who has the authority to turn somebody away from their property. So remember, businesses are private property, and um, if they are being disorderly and aggressive or in, in any way will not leave the premises, then that would be the time for the employees or owner or managers to call. Um, just if you see somebody, again, if, to make it clear that, remind people that while you're walking downtown, if you're socially distancing, you do not have to wear a mask with this ordinance. So if you see somebody walking on Central Avenue or um, on you know, 2nd, that's not a time to call 911. In fact, we will, at the city, if, if people want to, I would prefer that they call our office lines, um, our 863-2400 um, to to, if they have questions on the ordinance so that we don't inundate our police officers with calls that, that might just be clarifications on how the ordinance is written. Anything further, Rebecca, at this time? Andy, any questions or comments for staff? Uh, no questions. Ben and Ryan asked the questions that I was concerned about. Thanks, Andy. I do have a question, Dana. Under Section 2, use of face coverings required, Item A, which currently reads, all places of business must require employees, contractors, volunteers, customers, and visitors to wear a face covering in areas open to the general public. And then under section 3F, which is uh, exemptions, it states for individuals while in their private individual offices provided social distancing of at least six feet can be maintained. Um, and I'm sorry, I was referencing section 2B. All places of business must require employees to wear face coverings in areas not open to the general public if social distancing is not maintained. If you have a professional office in town 
and you can socially distance within your office place, are you therefore exempt from face coverings? That is correct. So um, if you have your own private office, um, one of the things though is you move <clears throat> into a common area where you might not be able to social distance, that's where masks would be required. Um, but while you're in your private office where you don't have the public um, visiting, that is um, correct. What if the example business is, for example, an automobile dealership or repair facility? So if they are working, say they're in a shop and they're working as an individual on a vehicle, they would not need to wear their mask. Um, if they are in their sales department um, where they're interacting with the public, they do need to wear masks. Uh, there is a plexiglass um, or protective barrier exemption, but that barrier would have to be uh, completely uh, enclosing those individuals. So for example, example a, a drive up um, teller at a bank. Uh, all you have is a drawer that you're passing your funds through um, and um, other places that might have a full uh, glass or protective barrier. So, um, but while they're working on their vehicles, if they're by themselves and socially distanced, that would be okay that they don't wear a mask. Would it make any sense under item section 2A to add if social distancing is not possible? And I, I don't know if you have the ordinance in front of you. I don't have it in front of me, but Maybe I Angie can answer that, please. So the way it reads now is all places of business must require employees, contractors, volunteers, customers, and visitors to wear a face covering in areas open to the general public. My question is, should we add if social distancing is not possible? I think we could add that. Um, where I see it as problematic is isn't it kind of subjective if you know, you're know you with the general public, you know, where social distancing is um, possible. Um, you know, it's the, rec <clears throat> pardon me, the recommended, uh, you know, distance is six feet. Um, I, I think you kind of open a bottle there, um, just because it's really pretty subjective. Whereas requiring, um, you know, visitors, employees um, in places where the general public is, you know, is not so subjective. That's my opinion. I think you could add it, but I think it kind of opens up a can of worms. Okay, thanks, Angie. Rebecca. I, I just was wondering about hair cutters um, because the, the correct social or physical distancing isn't being maintained between someone having their hair done and cutting it. And so I'm just wondering why we excluded that. I think one of the, the challenges is um, being able to maneuver when cutting hair around the ears. Um, we would obviously encourage the uh, customer to have a face covering. Uh, the employee, though, would be required to have a face covering, is my understanding of the ordinance. And so um, it would just be the, the customer who is getting their hair cut at the time. Mm -hmm. Further questions or clarifications from the council? Ben. Hey, Dana, would it make any sense to require sign it, certain signage at the businesses to, so folks that are visiting that may not be familiar with what we're doing here know what to expect and whether it does make sense to require it or not, do we have any plans to provide um, suitable signage for the businesses? So under number five, duties of place of business, we do have um, it listed in there that they must post, post signage notifying its customers and patrons of this ordinance. And we will work on signage. We've already provided um, various types of signage throughout this um, public health emergency, and uh, we will have uh, signs that are updated. Thank you. I missed that line. Thanks. Anything further from the council? I wanted to address just a couple comments that, or questions I believe Kevin Gartland had with the chamber. Uh, Kevin, unless you correct me, have we addressed the enforcement question, how we're gonna communicate to visitors, and in the event a patron refuses to mask up, how we will handle that? In terms of enforcement, I think so. Um, Do you mind approaching the podium just so you can be on public record? Thanks, Kevin.
yeah, enforcement-wise, I think that that sheds a little bit of light on there on how that's supposed to take place. Still have questions about it in practice. Um, and again, I'd just like to reiterate Dana's comment that if the businesses, if they are, there are patrons that refuse, that it's not a 911 call unless it's necessary. It's a call to City Hall. Okay, yeah, I'll put that out for you. Um, in terms of the, of, the, of the ordinance itself and how we communicate that to visitors, uh, are we going to re rely solely on stores on the uh, signs on the front of the door? Are we doing banners? Sorry. Are we doing uh, other street side signage? Um, what does that look like? I'll let Dana address that, Kevin. Okay. You want to do it now? Should we play tag team? I'm going to do that one right there. I would like to. Okay. <laughs> I did write. I, I did write down what you had asked, Kevin. Um, so for uh, signage, we are. I've got. Um, you know, we're going to work with MDT to see what kind of signage we can put in um, on our right-of-ways. Um, unfortunately, on our highway entrances, that is MDT right-of-way. We're looking to see what we have as options there. Um, our, we do have our banner across um, the, the highway. We can look at updating that. Um, but we will be doing a PSA and working with the Convention and Visitors Bureau to make sure that um, this is widely known by those that are going to come visit. Uh, we are working on our Google um, used to um, identifying city hall we'll be able to when people search city of whitefish and it, if they're they're coming to city hall is going to be the one where it will be able to say here's the covid restrictions but businesses can also update that as well they um, now have a covid alerts for businesses so you can go on and update any covid alerts when um, people put in your business address to drive there um, so we'll be working on that as well as PSAs with the mayor and getting the information out through the media. Um, for masks, um, my understanding is that the CVB and the chamber received combined 3,000 masks for um, visitors or, or whomever they would like to use those for. Um, we'll be working with the CVB to see how we can, and the chamber to see how we can utilize those masks up front. But the city is working on procurement of masks um, and we, we're working on quotes, but we haven't purchased them yet since it's not required yet. But we've got the, the quotes coming in so that we could also have some available at our location, uh, reusable masks. Obviously, uh, the disposable ones um, do fill our landfills, and we'd prefer people to wear cloth face coverings. So working on procuring that, the CARES Act uh, funds are eligible for the city to request reimbursement from the state. So that would be um, funding that is available for masks for our customers. So we would have to probably have the location here for pickup, but um, businesses could then um, ask their patrons to come to City Hall or whatever location we determine best um, for the other 3,000 masks. Does that answer your question, Kevin? <laughs> so as Dana said, we're expecting about 2,000 reusable cloth masks to arrive from uh, the hospital association is actually the, the folks who made those available to us. And our plan with those 2,000 masks is to make those available to our members, to our business folks, for their staff folks, the reusable masks. Uh, when we talk about what we may need in terms of disposable masks or one-time use masks for visitors who don't have those, that's the, the, the larger question that I have, really. And uh, we've looked at the, at the uh, business adaptability grant that the state has, and that does allow you, as John and I had talked about last week, up to about $10,000. We've got about 5000 of that spent. So we're looking to see how we can leverage those funds. We're certainly willing to go ahead and throw whatever we have left in that pot into the, into the in mix because we just want to make sure folks, uh, our businesses aren't overly burdened by this, and this has the potential to, to give them a real sock in the wallet. So and anything that the city can do in those, in those regards, if we can team up and, and do that, make a larger purchase and get those masks at a reasonable cost, we're willing to do that. Thanks. I'll just follow up. The, the governor's office will be issuing the second round of business adaptability grants under the CARES Act. It should be rolled out here in the next couple of weeks based on my discussions with Tom Livers and Mark Bostrom at DEQ, or the DNRC, excuse me. Um, and I believe those grants will be an additional $5,000 that businesses can apply to for PPE masks and sanitation equipment and the like. With that said, the only additional comment I had on the ordinance is related to in the event that we do have a federal or state directive that comes down, which I imagine is very likely, 
Uh, we do have a provision in this ordinance that includes a more restrictive standard control to the extent any state, federal, or local regulations, laws, or orders are more restrictive than this emergency ordinance. Such regulations, laws, or orders uh, will certainly apply. Are there any further comments from the council or questions for staff? I think to move this along, given the hour, um, I would prefer a motion one way or another for discussion purposes. Rebecca. I'd like to make a motion to approve, um, is it an emergency resolution 20-11? Emergency ordinance. A emergency ordinance 20-11. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Rebecca, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. I really, really appreciate everybody showing up for this discussion. Again, I'm removing my mask because we have people in the community who are deaf who read lips, not because I'm a hypocrite, because I have been wearing a mask for four months, many different variations of it. Um, so I really appreciate the diverse opinions of people because it means that everybody is studying this problem. Um, and it means that you're bringing something to the table, to our brains, that we might not have thought of before. So. When we prepare for public hearings, we review pretty much all the public comment that we receive in writing. Um, we also prepare by reading staff information. And then when people come to the public hearing, that we're, what we're listening for is something new that we haven't thought of before that might change our trajectory. So if we see, hear the same things over and over again, we go, yeah, we got that covered, we got, we've heard of that, yeah, that's been refuted by this. And so the whole time our minds are actively engaged in listening to the public. So it might seem when, we, when you all show up and we, we're not moving in the direction that you want us to, that we're not taking in what you've said, but that really is not true. We actually do take in everything you say. And the other thing is, um, we are the government, like we are formally the government. Might not seem like it because we're your neighbors and we're, you know, around town bicycling and walking our dogs, and, but we are elected officials and we are the local government. So we do make laws to protect the citizens that we are legally required to take care of. So for instance, if someone, if we told you there's a wildfire coming towards your house, you have to evacuate right now, very few of you would remain in your homes if the government or emergency response people said, oh my God, there's a, the firefighters are in the way, you better leave, you would probably leave. And so this is one of those very unusual, unprecedented times where we have a public health emergency where it's like that, that it changes very rapidly. The science has changed dramatically from January when we first found out about this pandemic to now, it's gonna keep changing daily. And to, to lock in one thing that was said three months ago isn't really valid, maybe even in a month, because there's scientists all over the world studying this virus, and there's people working very hard all around the clock trying to come up with solutions so that more people don't die, and in addition, that they, we don't keep the spread going. So we've never in our lifetimes had to wear face coverings to stop the spread of a virus. Now we're being asked to do that because it's a little bit of a Hail Mary, like will it work or not? But what we're seeing in other countries that have done this and in other, other cities and other states, it does seem to, to reduce the transmission rate and keeps the virus close to you if you are an asymptomatic carrier or pre-symptomatic carrier. So it's not the only thing that we have to do. We have to remember that we also have to maintain social, physical space from each other. If anybody is immune compromised, like the little family that was here, you need to take special precautions not to be around other people because you don't want to get this virus. It's very dangerous. So I'm just going long on this because I want to reassure people that we're not doing this to take away rights. We're not doing it to harm you. We're doing it because we sincerely care about everybody that lives here. 
And when people say something like, it's only this many deaths, it always, like, my heart goes, why do we have any deaths? Like, we could get through this with no more deaths if we do this right, no more sickness. Because the other thing that's happening now is we know that the virus actually changes organs and might develop into long-standing health issues for people. So the vast majority of people will get through it probably with no long-term effects, but maybe 10% might have long-term organ damage. And if we can prevent that by cooperating with each other, it's worth it. If we can prevent people from dying, it's worth it. If we can prevent healthcare frontline people from getting uh, ill because they're brave enough to show up over and over again to take care of the most sick amongst us, it's worth it. And so it's, it's not easy to take these measures. Um, it, there's a long learning curve to wearing a face mask. There's a long learning curve to not want to go and hug your friends and be close to each other. But I was really encouraged to, to hear that the teachers have been working with the children on how, um, how this will work if we do get to go back into the school setting in the fall. And um, uh, I, I just want to remind the adults in the room that we model for the children what's normal. So if, you, if this is something we're going to have to live with for one to two years, let's model it correctly. You know, it doesn't have to be a contentious issue. It can be, okay, here we are. Nobody likes it, but we're going to do it. And if that saves a life or it prevents organ damage or it allows the economy to stay open, it allows children to actually be taught, not by their parents, nothing against their parents, but by real teachers, I think it's worth an attempt. So I am going to vote for favor. Thank you, Rebecca. Further comments from the council? There was a question posed of us that I'm certainly going to respond to, you know, why we're doing this. And we're doing this for the businesses and for the friends of mine that work in the downtown, that sling beers, that wait tables, that bus dishes, that are in a very risky environment. And they came to us asking for this city government to help protect them. And that's why we're here this morning. I certainly hope that we can look back in two to three months and say that we missed the mark and we overreacted. But if not, I certainly won't regret the action we're taking uh, this morning. And I wanted to thank everyone for participating. With that said, all those in favor of the motion, please. I'd like to oh, Ryan. Yep, I've got just a, some brief comments here. Um, I too would agree with what the mayor said. Um, you know, the idea that you know, my friend who tends bar at the Bulldog is forced to wear a mask, um, but the customers that are coming in from who knows where um, don't have to wear a mask. That feels like a failure on my part. Um, and I have spoken with numerous people like that um, that say, we're built on a tourism economy. People are coming from all over. We don't know where they're coming from. We need to do something to help stop the spread. Um, and, you know, when I was talking to my, my mother-in-law, and she was talking about this song that she really likes. It's called Most People Are Good. Um, I've never really heard it, um, but I listened to it, and I read the lyrics, and I genuinely want to believe that is true. Um, but when, when we get emails, and like the mayor said, I did read every single email that came in. Um, when we get emails that is just a screenshot of someone that was beaten to death for supporting masks, and then the subject says, vote no on masks. Um, you know, I I'm more inclined to listen to every single person in my family that says, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time with the city council? You make no money. It takes up all your time. You drive to Kalispell for work in the morning, and then you drive back to Whitefish for a meeting. Um, my wife doesn't sleep at night because she's worried someone's going to break into our house and find out where we live. She's begged me for months, quit, quit, quit. What are you doing? Um, I, I guess I just, I guess I do believe that most people are good. Um, and, you know, does the, 
does wearing a mask help prevent the spread? I think that's the big question here. Um, and I understand how people will say that it doesn't help. And I understand, I, I've, I followed this from the start. I remember, I believe it was around early March, someone was on the Anderson Cooper show, some doctor said, masks don't really protect you because the droplets are too small, um, but it does help a little bit because it seems to be a barrier. Then the Surgeon General was on another show in March saying the masks aren't effective. He said only wear it if you have it. There's no data showing it doesn't prevent the spread. Um, the Surgeon General also tweeted out a tweet that said masks are not effective and he had a little link on the tweet. This was back in March. That tweet is still up and if you, go to, if you click that link now, it says wear a mask. So I completely understand the inconsistency that people have. Um, there was also an article, I believe it was from the Washington Post, that talked about they recommended wearing them in China, but not in the US. And that was a little puzzling to me. I was like, if they're wearing them in China to slow the spread, why wouldn't they work here? If we're trying to pre prevent respiratory droplets, um, why wouldn't we want to wear a mask? And then there was another article, I believe it was from The Hill, where um, Dr. Fauci says not to worry. You don't have to worry about this pandemic. You don't have to wear a mask. Um, and I'm reading all these articles that are saying this virus is spread by respiratory droplets through the air, and then they're saying, for some reason, this thing that covers my mouth won't prevent me from getting sick or spreading it, and it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and I understand the six feet apart, that seems to be, you know, gravity tends to take care of those droplets if you're six feet apart. Um, the droplets that I release won't reach Michelle right now, they'll fall to the ground. Um, I think what happened was, we as a nation didn't have the capacity to manufacture enough masks for the people that needed them. Um, we didn't have, whether it's the ability or the political will to organize a government response uh, to produce these masks in a mass scale in order to prevent a lot of, a lot of deaths. Um, I don't know how many of the over 100,000 deaths could have been prevented. Um, I don't think that question will ever be answered. Um, instead, we seem to get these media cycles where, you know, masks are bad, wait, they're good now, wait, they're bad, nope, they're good again. Um, all I think this does is cover up the fact that there has really been a failure on a national level of our government's ability to address this public health crisis. Um, I remember a story about a Detroit bus driver who was upset, this was months ago, that riders were not wearing masks, he was not provided with a mask. Um, and I understand why they weren't wearing masks. I mean, this was late February, early March, they've been told not to. Um, and then I think it was a couple weeks later after he spoke out, he was dead. He died of COVID. Um, and then finally, it seemed like once we were telling people not to wear masks to prevent people from hoarding them for the people who actually needed them, like the healthcare workers and the people on the front lines, um, because we didn't have enough. And we had all these states bidding against each other. Um, there just weren't enough. So I think they were telling people don't hoard them so that way ER doctors aren't dying and we can try to get this thing under control. Now you start to see these organizations start to fall in line. Um, I think April 4th, is when we got a half-hearted recommendation from the CDC, um, and they've since changed direction and now recommend masks. Um, and the World Health Organization followed suit around June 5th. And, and all this shows me, and it should show everyone, is that your federal government did not have the capacity to properly manage a public health crisis. And me, sitting up here, if given the choice between doing nothing and doing something, I'm going to side on the side of public health. I have no choice but to do that. Um, because I don't want it to be three months from now and we end up like hospitals in Texas calling for refrigerated trailers to store the dead. Um, and I guess I'll end by saying that this is a mess. Um, it's a mess, I think it's gone on way too long. Um, but I would really implore people to step back 
and say, you know, wait a minute here. I'm not going to follow along with these, what seem to be, you know, manic highs and lows that we get from the media every single day. I'm gonna take a step back, try to get some sense of reality, keep my emotions in check and stay vigilant, ask questions, do your own research. It's voluminous, it's tough. Um, and I would just ask that you hold these people accountable, me included. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Steve. Thanks, John. Um, and I just wanna reiterate, oh, I'm sorry, hold this down so people can read my lips. Um, re reiterate what Ryan said, a um, couple points. The first one being that uh, I think it's, it's worse than just a lack of being ready for this pandemic for, on a national level. I think it's a failure of leadership at the highest levels um, to, to manage this. Places that have managed it have had leadership at the highest levels that have um, taken it seriously and acted. Uh, and as an elected official in a town that has that routinely sees triple the population or quadruple the population in the summertime, people from coming from hotspot areas, like Ryan said, it, it behooves us to act. It's irresponsible if we do not act to do what other places in this country and across the world have done to help prevent the spread of the disease. It's not to prevent deaths. It's not to prevent, um, it's not to prevent you don't wear a mask to prevent yourself from getting it. You are wearing a mask like a surgeon would to prevent spreading a disease to someone unwittingly. That's, that is the point. And I would hope, um, and then the other thing that Ryan said that I firmly believe in is that I do believe all people are good. I honestly do because to believe the other is no way to live a life. And we don't have a lot of time in this world and so I would hope that, um, that people would see this as an opportunity to sort of flip the script here. And rather than see this as a draconian government mandate coming down to take away your freedom, to see it for what it really is, which is this is a town, and all of us that are up here have been here for a long time. This is a town that is a community and we help each other out in times of crisis. I gave away toilet paper too, lots of it, because I had a lot, don't ask me why. I just did, probably because it was on sale at Costco like years ago. <laughs> um, I would hope that, that we can see this community for what it is, that we are people that help each other, that we do what is right by each other. And I would like, it would be great if we could flip this script a little bit and say, hey, instead of, you know, toilet paper issue has settled itself. It sounds like the downtown businesses need masks. Maybe my job now is to go out and buy 500 masks and give them to a downtown business so that they have masks to give to their customers. Because maybe that's the right thing to do here. Um, so I will be voting for this ordinance because it is time for the elected officials, for the leaders to act. The leader, it's time for leadership to lead. And that is our job, that's what we were elected to do. There'll be another election in two years. I'll be here for the next almost four. And if you know my actions uh, prove to be not worthy to be reelected, then that's, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, but it is time for us to lead, and this is this this is what we need to do in order to keep our to to keep the community that we care about, the people that we care about who live here and work here, and even the visitors who visit here because they are the ones who keep us in business. It's time for us to do to to enact this mask ordinance now. And we're not the only place doing it; lots of places are doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Further comments from the council? Andy. Um, I said this a week ago. I understand that those that are opposed to mask wearing are not going to be convinced by anything that I'm going to say up here. And I understand that. Um, 
I would say that I'm probably somewhat envious of the certainty of their position. I would like to say that I have the certainty of position if I vote for this ordinance that it's going to save the world. I know it's not going to. Um, I think that we get looked at sometimes in an incorrect light by people that don't agree with the things we do and I'm very comfortable. I've sat up here for almost 21 years now and I can pretty much tell you that 60% of the people at any given point in time are going to agree with what we do and about 40% are not going to be happy. And I've also learned that it's never the same 60 and 40%. So eventually over time, you're going to pretty much, excuse my French, piss everybody off. That's just the way it works. And so what I've always tried to do, and I think one of the things that got brought up in it by a number of speakers in opposition tonight, or is it, no, it's daytime, that's right, um, is the politic politicization of this issue. And, what I can tell you is there's no one up here that makes any money. There's very few of us that even raise any money for an election campaign. Typically, we might spend 50 bucks for something on our own. We don't have an R, we don't have a D behind our name. And I like to think of all of the people I've served with, and it's a considerable number at this point in my career, that we make decisions that are pragmatic, that serve our community the best that we can given the information and the knowledge that we have at any given point in history. And I'm fully aware that at times in the rearview mirror, we can look back and we can say, you know, that was really not a great decision. And I've done it many times. I've second-guessed myself infinitely more than I would ever want to. But I think that's what makes a small town government operate. And Ryan hit the nail on the head. Unfortunately, we didn't have a clear federal response and then it got handed down to the states. And then we've had a semi-clear state response, but now that we're seeing things kind of ramp back up all around the country, we're not getting a full-on state response. We certainly haven't gotten a county response. And then that ultimately then falls in our lap as local government, which it's been a lot of past the buck. I am apprehensive about one part of the ordinance that we are then passing that buck on down to our businesses and requiring them to deal with the problem. But we also know that enforcement is difficult, but I think that, you know, as we discussed it as staff and certainly with our law enforcement, that can be something that will be manageable. And I'm fully aware that masks are not a silver bullet to save the world. I know that. It's not going to do it. But if we save one life with that, then I think, you know, we've done everyone a really, a really good service. And the only argument that has come up a week ago and came up again today is everyone wants to throw out the statistic of how many people die as a percentage of people that get COVID. And I find that, quite frankly, horribly offensive. And anyone that is willing to trot that out in front of my face I would invite you to go ahead and contact a family or a friend worldwide of the hundreds of thousands of people that have lost their lives to this. And I think you would probably get a much different response than you would to an audience of people that are like-minded. And so, yeah, maybe the percentage is relatively small, but you know what? People are dying, and people are dying needlessly, and that's sad. And one gentleman said, "Why I want to know why you're voting for this. And we can find a preponderance of people out there that are going to tell us masks don't do any good. But we can probably find a greater percentage of people that are going to tell us from health professionals, from health organizations, public health agencies, all of those people that, you know what, they do help. Yeah, they're not perfect. They do help a bunch. And if we can look at countries where this was not politicized, and I'm going to pull out the country that I actually work in, and that's Vietnam, which is a country of 100 million people, 100 million people. They are a communist government, one party, so it didn't get politicized there. They just did the right thing right away in early January when the outbreak first happened in China. And what they did was they locked that country down in the Second thing they did is they went to mandatory masks. Now, guaranteed people in Asia are much more used to wearing masks already. 
They had always done it. I lived and worked in Hong Kong for a number of years. If you even had a cold and you were going to be using mass transit, as a courtesy to everyone else on that subway train you were riding, you just put a mask on. That's just what you did. You didn't think about it. You didn't do it to protect yourself. You did it to protect your fellow community members. The country of Vietnam, 100 million people, has had 373 cases total and zero deaths. That is something you cannot argue with. You can find any rabbit hole on the internet you want, but that is fact. And they tested everybody. And their economy is back up and running pretty much full speed right now. You came back into the country, you had a 14-day mandatory quarantine. Mandatory. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to go stay at the hotel and run out to the northern and get a burger. It was, no, you quarantined. Canada did the same thing. You went back across the border if you'd been down here. You had to have a plan with the list of people that were going to provide you with food, where you were going to be. And Canada's down to 300 cases a day right now. And they are only a country of 33 million people, but still, there are only 300 cases a day. So if I look around and the gentleman wants to know why and how I'm making my decision, I can look empirically and see that where people have been pretty strict about it, it has had an impact. And I can look at a country that has the best health care system in the world, and we have the highest level of outbreak and the greatest number of deaths. What went wrong here? We allowed personal liberty arguments that, quite frankly, came from a political bent. They didn't come from a health bent. Get in the way of doing the right thing for our country and doing the right thing for our neighbors and doing the right thing for everybody else that's out there. And that, that's hard. And I mean, it's, but it is the way this country operates, and I understand that. But I think now we need to kind of all band together a little bit and just say, hey, let's just do the best we can for everybody. If we weave enough imperfect things together, maybe we can weave a reasonable safety net to get us through this and get us back and running like we should be. So on that, I'll shut up. Thanks, Andy, for the comments. Further comments from the council? Ben. In the spirit of the gentleman who has asked us all to explain ourselves, I will also offer a brief comment on such an important ordinance. I, uh, I feel that the situation in town has been changing extremely rapidly. I know a couple weeks ago, quite honestly, I lived in a state of blissful ignorance about the coronavirus. It seemed like we hadn't had it for weeks, and um, it seemed like life was going back to normal. But, you know, for me, looking around at what's happening, that does not seem to be the case anymore. We have tremendous visitation coming into town, which I think, okay, but um, a lot of those people are traveling from high-risk areas. Um, a lot of people are coming here, and some of them have the coronavirus. We know that. And so um, I think it's time to do something here and, you know, do masks work? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, are they perfect? No. But based on my own research and my, and I read a lot of stuff, they help significantly. And that's the reason why every credible health organization I know of has recommended their use. So, you know, I know just being around town in the last week, I think what we did last Monday um, helped, but I know that I have personally witnessed, I'm not naming names, but several of what I would describe as extremely high risk situations indoors around town in the last week with lots of people packed inside with, without masks. And um, I think the health and safety of our community demands nothing less than us taking action here, and so I support this ordinance. Um, I do have some concerns about the enforcement mechanism, but you know, ultimately um, the situation is changing, and I take solace in the fact that if, if there's problems or we need to adjust things, I know this group will. And as things develop in town and as the virus situation changes and if we have enforcement problems or what have you, uh, we'll address it. So um, I think this is for the folks who live here and are unsafe, and I think this is the right thing for us to do, and I look forward to us passing this ordinance shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Last call. Further comments? 
quickly, Rebecca, please. Okay. There was a, a mention that there might be violence around this and all that from a woman who had moved here from other places. And I, I just would like to remind people that the reason why Whitefish is a somewhat magical place to live is because we really, really care about each other. People are in, like so kind, you can't even imagine. I could give you a thousand ways that people have helped one another that will never be known. Um, and it, it's kind of like, I think, the template of how we do our community. And so I was appalled to hear that. And just remember that if you're part of our community and you, even if you come into our community, that is our legacy. It's to be kind and respectful and caring to one another, no harm. If someone cannot wear a mask, don't question them. There's a reason why they're not wearing a, wearing a mask. If a child can't wear a mask, you step away. You know, you don't have to make an issue of someone else's situation. You can be responsible for yourself. But our community cares deeply about everybody that lives here and, ha and comes here. And so we expect the best behavior as well. Thanks, Rebecca. Before we vote, this emergency ordinance, if passed, will take effect at 12.01 a.m. on Wednesday, July 15th, which is tomorrow morning. The ordinance will remain in effect for one month thereafter unless sooner repealed, and the City Council may also extend this emergency ordinance for one or more additional terms. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and the motion does carry. Thanks, everyone, for attending. We are adjourned. All right.